Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Erin Elmore. My guest today is Jason Shears. Jason is a psychotherapist and certified transformative coach who's been working with addictions and mental health for over 25 years. He has a personal story of addiction and mental health struggles spanning four decades, both as a consumer of mental health services and also as a professional. Jason's really open to sharing his personal experiences, so today we'll hear more about his struggles and how they ultimately led to him developing an innovative approach to treating addiction and mental health issues called the Infinite Recovery Program. Jason, welcome. We're so happy to have you here today. Hi, thanks. I'm looking looking forward to see where the conversation goes. Yes, me too. Yeah. Well, as we begin, do you want to share a bit more about your story and what inspired you to work in mental health and addiction recovery? Yeah, I think like many people who who work in the field, you know, either they've been related to somebody suffered who suffered, or they've suffered themselves. You know, and, and my story was from a very early age. You know, I had a traumatic experience as a child. I lost my dad. He was killed in an accident, and straight away, I think that my food became my coping mechanism, my friend, my loyal companion. You know, in life, and my weight ballooned as a result. My, I guess I lost one parent physically, and I lost the other parent emotionally which Mm. is a very traumatic experience for a child, you know, trying to make sense of the world. I guess if people ask me to say what was my childhood like in one sentence, it would be work it out for yourself. You know, Mm. that's what it would have been. So without that present parent or that reflection or that ability to sort of understand grief or to be with emotional experience or or whatever happened in that time, you know, it's kind of like it, it becomes like a traumatic event that as a child you find your own way to cope with. So for me, food was the innocent you know i say innocent because you know it was completely innocent as a child not knowing any different just finding a way to be okay you know that's all it was and my mum bless her you know was probably by the time i was eight or nine years old she was already at her wit's end with trying to cope with me you know like to deal with me to know what to do with me so she just contacted the local psychiatric it was like a clinic you know at the time and um, took me there because that's what she was trying to get help for me, you know, trying to do her best. And I was put on antidepressants. I think I was nine or 10 years old, which I didn't wow. actually know until until later when I started doing psychotherapy training and I went back and got my medical reports, you know, from, from my childhood and started to look at all these psychiatric reports that were created. So yeah, I was given my first diagnosis, nine or 10 years old, put on medication. And then from there, things went pretty much downhill, you know, like started to get brought home by the police, get into crime and stealing things, stealing from home, you know, peer pressure, going out with guys, stealing things. You know, this was a very young age. And then I found drugs really, really young. You know, school, I mean, I... I mean, there's so much to my story, but like, I try and keep it as brief as possible. Like, but like school was crazy. I was very intelligent. You know, I think I always try and make the distinction between helping people understand that, you know, you can be really intelligent and have no clue about your emotional experience. You know, I, I, I got a full bursary and scholarship for the, for the local private school, which was prestigious and, and expensive, you know, it's like, but my intelligence was so high that they gave me a full bursary but my behavior was so chaotic that I got kicked out three years later Mm -hmm. Um, and from there I just got into drugs drugs was I I didn't even drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes at the time but actually heroin was the first drug that I took as a young teenager simply because I met people who had it at the time and 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 as soon as I took drugs it was like you know at that point I probably had about eight years of what I call torture in my own mind you know just being me was torture there was a there was a a terrible sense of dis-ease inside of me, or what you might call the committee, you know, was waiting for me on a daily basis when I woke up, you know, my self-worth, my beliefs about myself, my beliefs about life, my beliefs about others, you know, were, were painful. And when I found drugs, because drugs are only ever the solution, you know, they're never the problem. So drug, drugs were absolutely worked perfectly for what they're meant to do. You know, they, yeah. they, made, they made my mind go quiet. They helped me find an internal sense of ease. They stopped the obsession of the mind and the compulsion of the body that was constantly 
going on to find something, to do something, to escape from myself, to eat more food, to commit more crime. They stopped all that. You know, they were they were the solution to everything. So that was the first time I ever took drugs. And I can remember that vividly, that experience going, oh my God, this is it. I found the answer to life. You know, it's kind of like, I can't understand why I've never knew about this before. I, I never want to not do this. You know, this is the feeling that I want. You know, I want to feel at peace. Mm -hmm. And I was just at 13 years old, you know, I was already kind of, a, a, a friend at the time said to me, look at you, you're addicted already. You know, the first mm. time I ever took drugs and he wasn't wrong. You know, it's kind of like, I just felt like I'd landed, you know? Mm -hmm. And from then on, it was 10 years of complete chaos, you know, prisons, institutions, psychiatric wards, attempts at manipulating the medical system for prescription medication, committing crime, being involved in organized crime to get money to feed an addiction, you know, and constantly going to jail, coming out of jail, not understanding or knowing what was going on, but just thinking to myself, you know, I'll just have one this time and then I'll get back to this normal life that I sure. had made up in my mind while I was in jail, not knowing that it was the first one, you know, that I took that set me off on the cycle again. So as soon as I take one, I'd be, I'd be nonstop. I wasn't able to stop again. And then carried on until my early 20s when I went into rehabilitation for the first time. And I only, I mean, I only chose the rehabilitation center that I went into because it was nearby. And I had the illusion in my mind, I didn't even know what 12 steps was, but I had the illusion in my mind that I needed a break because I'd been on the streets. I lived in a homeless shelter at the time. I'd been in jail. And I kind of thought if I went to rehab, someone would feed me sleeping tablets and give me a PlayStation. You know, it's kind of like... and that Babysitting, was, yeah. <laughs> like that, that'd be what it was, you know. It's kind of like... And that sounded really appealing compared to the life that I had. So I went to rehab and I had a, a huge shock because it was like therapeutic, you know, like getting up early, groups, no phones, no communication, no, no, books, no magazines, no fun, nothing. Don't even smile. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of like whatever you do, just do all this painful digging into your past. Which you'd been trying to avoid for so long. Yeah. And, and, and food and drugs really were the solution because as soon as you took the solution away, you know, I had this huge emptiness inside of me, a huge void, you know, it's like that I tried to fill with everything and food became back to the food. You know, that was my first drug really. And I went straight back to the food and I was stealing food. I was eating food out of bins. I was stealing food out of the kitchen every night. I gained over a hundred pounds in eight weeks. You know, that's how much food I sort of shoveled into myself, just trying to escape my experience, you know, the emptiness that I felt inside. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I just escaped this grief my whole life, really. I just didn't want to face it. I couldn't face it. I didn't even know that I was escaping it, really. So my life for many years got better on the outside, but worse on the inside. You know, I went to 12 Steps. I smiled. I said my life was great. I'm not using drugs today. You know, I'm an addict, not knowing even what that was, just completely naive and, and, and just thinking that was what I had to do. I just fully accepted that I had this unexplainable disease that no one could explain where it came from or why I had it, but I had it and because I'd been told I had it and I needed to go to meetings in order to be okay. You know, that's what I believed and that's what I took on and that's what I did. But I didn't really get any better. You know, it's kind of like my life got great on the outside. I got a career, I got everything. You know, I had a car, I had a life, I had a home. My family started communicating with me again. I had some friends, you know, it's kind of like, but nobody knew what I was secretly up to the food, the obsession with the gym, the obsession with relationships and pornography and gambling and everything else that I could do to fill the emptiness inside of me that just felt endless, you know? It's like you replaced your coping with higher level coping and higher level coping, but on the inside, you still didn't have the insight or the healing that you needed. Yeah, it was just a more socially acceptable thing. Sure. You know? I mean, people in meetings used to openly joke about eating too much cake, for example, you know, it's kind of like it would be a common thing that people would come to meetings 12 steps after being on the streets or in jail about, I don't know, for a guy, maybe a, a 100 pounds or 120 pounds. You're in the US, so I use pounds. Yeah, like within a few months, they'd be 250 pounds. You know, it's like a common thing. Used to, all my friends were like that. Me too. You know, it's kind of like, and they used to joke about it. And they did seem okay with it, you know, gaining that weight. But I used to go home and secretly want to kill myself because mm -hmm. I just hated my body. I was so obsessed with the outside, thinking that if somehow I wasn't so overweight, I would feel happy. 
you know, it was always about finding this place of peace of mind and happiness, but there was, I just couldn't get there, you know, no matter what I tried. And so much so that during my years of recovery, you know, I had seven cosmetic surgeries over maybe a 15 year period, one in Asia, one in an Eastern European country and the rest of them in the UK. But can you imagine like the desperation of being put to sleep in a third world country, you know, just hoping to wake up thin and happy just because you were overweight. That's how intense my obsession with the body image and food was, you know, at mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, going to meetings, smiling, saying life was great, you know, because that's what people seem to do. And not that long after I got clean, a few years, started looking at counseling and psychotherapy. I did a counseling qualification first, and then I went into psychotherapy because, well, I would got a therapist and I thought to myself, you know, if I could learn this thing, whatever it is they know, you know, it's like maybe I could help myself. You know, that's why I went into it. You know, so I did all sorts of qualifications, you know, in, in multiple modalities of psychodynamic, of cognitive, of person-centered approach, you know, of NLP as well. You know, it's like I did them all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the end of it, I kind of thought, you know, I'm good at being present with somebody. I'm good at, I, I used to describe it as we could sit in the dark together, but nobody knew where the light switch was. You mm -hmm. know, that's that's how it felt. You know, if somebody came to me with a traumatic childhood, and that, you know, my estimation was it was going to take a few years. You know, it's like that was the therapy process. And I sat and I thought about it one day and I thought, you know, I know a lot of people that are therapists, you know, and it's kind of like, and I don't really know anyone who's happy. You know, it's mm. like I don't know anyone who's truly content, who says that they have a real peace of mind and what I call joy for no good reason, happiness for no good reason. You know, I didn't know anybody who had that. Mm-hmm. And, and on top of that, it talks about spiritual awakening and the 12 steps, you know, and it's kind of like, and I still used to say, what is this spiritual awakening thing? What does it actually mean? You know, it's like, and no one could really answer it to a satisfactory level where, I, where it made any sense to me, you know? And that, to be honest, I mean, there'd been some spiritual change for sure, because I'd gone from committing crime, you know, to, to having a somewhat productive on the outside life, but my internal world was still pretty devastating and my behavior right. was still pretty devastating you know so I always had this sense of seeking I always had this sense of kind of looking for something so after my all my therapy stuff I started doing other things all the other alternative things like silent meditations I did all of Tony Robbins courses coaching stuff I became a qualified life coach I did the Hoffman process I did the landmark forum I did anything I could where somebody told me that oh this might work you know there was right. All these new therapies were coming out, EMDR, rapid transformation therapy, tapping, different things, you know, were all being developed, I guess, at that time. I would try anything, you know, because I just wanted to experience some peace of mind. Around the 12 steps and around the therapy world that I was around, people used to say to me that, you know, seeking is your problem. You need to stop seeking. You know, they used to say to me, if you stop seeking, you'd be okay. But you can't say that to someone who's looking for an answer. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't well, they, work. That, that's what people used to say. And I used to think, how do you stop seeking? You know, I, in fact, I say to people, never stop seeking now. You know, that's what I say. Because to me, seeking is our intuition of home. It's our intuition of knowing a better life. It's our intuition of knowing that the experience we're having, there's something missing. It was only that what led me to my experience, I think. So... After Tony Robbins, it was only, I call it a serendipitous moment, you know, or life delivering to me or the universe working in my favor that I found this video called The Path of Effortless Change. And I just thought my whole life had been, you know, it's like carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. You know, mm -hmm. that's what it's been like my whole life. It's Absolutely. Like trudging through quicksand, you know, on a daily basis every day from the just moment I woke up. fight every day. Yeah. Yeah. So this, the name of this course just did it for me, effortless. You know, I thought mm -hmm. if there's nothing in my life has been effortless. Nothing has come easy. Nothing has been free. Nothing has been simple, you know. So I thought this course sounds great for everyone else. You know, it's kind of like I'm going to share this. I'm going to get it. You know, I'm going to share it with these people because I was in this personal development group. But as a, the only way I could share it was to watch it because – I couldn't find a way to download it. I had it playing and recording it, but what happened was it captivated me unknowingly to myself. I wasn't sat looking for the answers at the time. And I often say this to people now, you know, listen to my words kind of like you listen to music, you know, and if any of them really jump out and grab you, you know, it's kind of like take notice of that, you know, don't listen intently for the answers to your problems, but really 
allow the words to wash over you like you would, you know, if you're listening to a Kunzo or something. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I just kind of sat there and these words were coming, you know, and I kept finding myself going, wow, what's this guy talking about? You know, I really want to, I want to know more. There's something inside of me that feels resonance with, with what I'm hearing, you know, and I, and I listened to it, you know, and I was at the end of it, I kind of thought that was, you know, there was something really interesting about that, but I couldn't, my intellect hadn't caught, you know, I couldn't go, oh, I know this guy was saying, what I need to do is do this, this, and this, then I'll be was nothing like that you know it was just like a feeling of resonance of connection with some of the words that had been shared and a knowing a deeper knowing that I had to know more about it and my friend bought me a book of this guy's and I read it and I kind of thought don't know it was nothing much you know and then it was a year later when I was going to LA to a coaching training, something completely different. I'd remembered that this guy lived in LA. I looked him up and he, he had a, what he called a small group intensive happening two days after I was in LA. And I thought, I've got to change my flight. And I booked a place on this course and I went there and I spent two days only. And it was funny because, you know, I showed up there after years and years and years of credentials thinking that I knew a thing or two you know, but I was still angry and I was still empty, you know, mm -hmm. inside. And, and I remember him saying, you know, at the start of it, you know, I was kind of sat there revved up, you know, waiting for the answer to all my problems. <laughs> you know, right. he said, you know, can you just be here and just listen, like not try and compare this to something, you know, not see if it's the right or wrong, not listen in a way that you want to write that, you know, remember everything, because if you hear anything important, you'll remember it anyway. It was the first time anyone had ever invited me to be present, you know, mm, mm -hmm. like in, in every other training I'd been to, what happens was the person starts speaking, every person in the class pulls out their notebook and starts scribbling down everything that everyone's saying, you know, so I, I used to do that too, because that's what I thought you did, you know, in trainings. So I sat for two days and I just kind of had nothing on my mind and I just felt very present and listened, you know, and I, and I remember at the end of those two days, I kind of, I sat in this Airbnb and it was in Los Angeles and there was this beautiful green kind of valley at the back. You know, it was on a Friday afternoon, the sun was going down and there was this rope swing and I was just sat there feeling this beautiful sense of peace inside. And I thought, you know, I still, I can still feel the connection with that moment, you know, and I just think that I just kind of, again, my intellect had not caught up, you know, but I, because I was going, well, I haven't got more money. I've got a new relationship, haven't lost weight. You know, it's like, haven't got more clients in my business, can't really work out why I'm feeling so good. You know, it's like, yeah. well, I just knew. It's like I'd just woken up out of a bad dream. And I just had this beautiful feeling of bliss. You know, it was just stayed with me for hours and hours. And I just sat there out listening to the birds. And I thought, I don't remember if I've ever heard the birds like that before. I don't remember mm -hmm. if I've ever seen nature like that in that way before, you know, and it's kind of, and I just felt so peaceful. But I tell you what I knew, right? I knew that few days before I traveled back to England, I contacted my therapist and I was very fussy because I was a therapist about finding a therapist. I'd had the same therapist for seven years and I contacted her to say the next session will be the last one. I don't need it anymore, you mm -hmm. know? So I knew there's something inside of me that absolutely knew that all my seeking was for myself that I'd and that I'd had a realization of who I was and that I was no longer the addict to all the broken long list of diagnoses or the traumatized child anymore. I wasn't the victim. I wasn't a survivor either. You know, it's like all those things had happened, but I'd become caught up in them along the way and ironed them onto myself as part of my identity. I mean, so many things came to me in those couple of days. I thought, Shit, you know, I can't really do psychotherapy in the same way anymore because I don't really see the value of, of what I was doing before. I knew my life was going to change. I knew I didn't go back to 12 step meetings either. You know, I mean, I'd been in 12 steps for 22 years, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, and I'm, I'm 29 years clean now. So it's like, it took a while for my, for my brain to catch up with what had happened. As I describe it now, I had seen what I call true nature. You know, I'd had an experience of the what I call the perfect place of mental health inside of me. You know, it's like I'd seen through the thought story that I lived in on a daily basis. It had like fallen apart somewhere in those two days. I realized that on a daily basis, you know, I made up this story about myself 
who I thought I was, what had happened to me, what I was a victim of, what I was a survivor of, all the labels that had been given to me by the mental health profession, you know, over time. Innocently, I don't take any of it as malicious. I know no one had bad intentions, but I realized that all those things were not true. They were not who I was. They, they'd been a, a period of time in my experience, you know, of where I'd been at, but they were not who I was. And who I was was beyond all those things. And it was like a it's what I call a spiritual awakening. You know? It's a real seeing mm -hmm. of a deeper truth. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Most of us spend more time at work than anywhere else doing anything else. So why not spend that time in a job you love? Introducing Triad's Jobs Marketplace, the only job site dedicated specifically to behavioral and mental health professionals. Featuring more than 1,000 open jobs from dozens of behavioral and mental health employers and searchable by location, professional field, employment type, specialization, and more. Jobs Marketplace helps you find your next career opportunity. Full-time, part-time, or gig time, make the most of your time. To access Jobs Marketplace, register for your free professional account at hellotriad.com slash bht. That's hellotriad.com slash BHT, and then click to Jobs Marketplace. If you're already a member of the Triad community, visit app.hellotriad.com slash jobs. That's app.hellotriad.com slash jobs. Visit us today and take your next career step tomorrow. Yeah, I love that you're using that phrase because what I've been thinking is, well, a few things, but one thing is I heard someone say one time, and I feel like it's really true that people who struggle with addiction actually see the world in a deeper way and they have more insight perhaps than people who don't necessarily struggle with mental health or an addiction. And it's the idea that there's this existential angst that some people have. And I just kept thinking of that phrase when you were describing your story is, you know, you had all this knowledge and insight, but really your deep wound from trauma and really rough experience most of your life was existential, right? The questions you were asking and the seeking of who am I and what is this purpose? And so it seems like your search for peace was really an existential search, not a knowledge search. And I don't know if you're familiar with um, C.S. Lewis. He's one of my favorite authors, but he has a quote that says, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. So he uses that to explain this desire for heaven and like why, why death is so upsetting to us if we're not made for another world. And it seems to me like you were just having this existential struggle your whole life. And we know in order to feel peace and change, the research shows we need two things. One is knowledge, but one is an experience, a new experience. And it's like you had all this knowledge and all this training. You literally looked for every knowledge that was on the face of the earth, it seems like, and trained for all of this information, but that wasn't enough. You needed a, a new experience. And that's what you found in the retreat, the spiritual awakening, as you call it. Yeah, it makes sense, you know, and I guess what I what I've seen, you know, since then is that you know, like everyone is in search of themselves, you know, it's kind of like in all sorts of ways, you know, in all sorts of innocent ways, however, their beliefs have been colored, you know, in their experience, whatever their conditioning is, whatever their societal, cultural family conditioning was, whatever their traumatic or adverse events in childhood, you know, how, how their makeup was in their early lives and the decisions that they made. But there's a deeper paradigm, you know, there's a, there's a spiritual, you know, a spiritual being's having a human experience, you know, and there's part of us that is perfectly healthy at all times. You know, it's what I call innate health. You know, it's like there's a part of us that's not damaged, that's never can be damaged, you know, by our experience. And I guess one of the things that I learned in that, in that weekend was that life is an inside out experience. It's not an outside in experience. You know, for, for many people lost in the psychological professions and you know innocently again just following what they've been taught from a knowledge perspective not from a not from a deeper paradigm perspective and like you said you know people that have suffered you know it's like I, I say addiction is the lost man's way to enlightenment you know because it really is kind of always pointing us home back inwardly because we after we've tried everything else there's nothing else to do but you know the last choice is kind of like okay you know I have to look introspection is the answer not getting my ducks in a row, so to speak, in the outside world. Right, so, that comes second to feeling inner peace and calmness, yeah. 
Yeah. And that's kind of what, I, what I'd seen in that weekend was inside out meant that life was happening inside of me. You know, my creation of myself was inside of me. My projection, everything happened in my mind and I projected it onto the world. Not I saw what happened in the world and became a victim of that. And in fact, while there is a material paradigm outside of us, you know, objects, people, places and things, you know, it's like everything happens inside, you know, as Viktor Frankl said, you know, in between, I can't remember, I'll probably butcher the thing, but in between stimulus and experience, there's perception. That's what he said. And it's like, that's kind of what I saw is that everything is happening inside of me. It's my own perception. It's my own creation, you know, and, and what I believe is what happens. That's the self-fulfilling prophecy that happens. You know, what I believe about myself, I'm a, I'm an addict, I'm a victim, I'm, I've got a terrible life, nothing ever works out for me. And then I just create that in the world and then I go, see, I told you so, that's exactly what I said my life was. So I'd, I'd really seen that everything, everything, not, not most things or not some things, but everything, was happening inside of me my whole experience the perception and, is what really matters more so than what happens to people yeah yeah so how did you take that experience that i guess we'll call it the weekend retreat where you finally found peace and comfort and stillness for the first time and apply that to yourself moving forward but then also how did you use that to help other people I kind of knew my therapy practice would change, you know, at that point. And I didn't really know what implications that would have on my own life, you know, at the time. Right. But like everything changed. It's like, you know, like I said, I stopped going to 12 steps. My eating disorder of 40 years disappeared. It's never wow. come back. You know, it's like I didn't have to do anything. It just happened. You know, it, I just knew. I just felt, felt a deep sense of joy and peace with my life. You know, I did some trainings with the same guy, you know, in America that I, that I had that first experience with some, and I was mentored by a couple of people in the U S for a few years, you know, I really wanted to get my head around how I could share what I'd experienced with other people in an effective way, you know, how I could help to point people to the truth. I, I mean, I guess what the way I see it today is, you know, I just became one of the many fingers pointing to the same moon and like. There are lots of spiritual traditions, East and, and lots of Western treatments that incorporate Eastern traditional stuff. You know, it's kind of like, I say today my work's psycho-spiritual, you know, it's it's the psychological mm -hmm. coupled with the Eastern and, and spiritual stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So I kind of spent those few years really being in that beautiful experience. I mean, it was it was an amazing, and, and a lot of it was undoing, you know, and a lot of what I do today is undoing, undoing what people believe about themselves, undoing what's been installed into people, undoing what people think they need to do to change. There's all sorts of beliefs that people have bought into innocently over time for the experiences that they've had, especially in the systems. If they've been through the system, have been through rehab, they've been through therapy and stuff. They believe change is hard, that it's difficult, that they've got a long list of things that's wrong with them and that, you know, the possibility of peace is long way away and takes hard work and stuff. When no, it can happen in a second, you know, an insight mm -hmm. can happen in a second and change comes from the inside out. You know, I call it an unfolding because it's already seeing something that's already there. It's not teaching somebody something new in order for them to have a better experience. It's not like a, a technique or, or something that they have to do to get better. It's just like by relaxing the cognitive function of their own mind, they get to see the deeper truth that's already there within them. So I spent those few years really kind of looking at, you know, doing those trainings and looking at how I would share this stuff with others. And then just in my work, I just continued my work and, and my work with others has really helped me see how effective it was to point people to their innate health versus treating them as having something wrong with them and trying to fix it. You know, I, I saw the massive impact that it had on people in a short period of time. Like, whereas, like I said before, people that had come to my practice before, let's say they'd been abused, raped, or been had a violent childhood or been had drug, drug addicted parents, it would be years of therapy. You know, it's kind of like, and I started to see people have a dramatic change in the space of a few hours of session. And I was always the first port of call where people would say, you're the first person that said that I'm okay, that I'm not Aww. broken. You yeah, know? that yeah. is one of the big uh, 
faults that people talk about a lot with the psychology system or mental health system in general is it's really problem focused, which is understandable. Like we want to help people get better, but the language and the focus is very negative. And so I've heard that recently over the years that people are trying to come up with a, a different approach that's more positive and more empowering. And so it sounds like you've definitely uncovered an avenue to do that. Can you give an example of what that might look like in session? Because I mean, I love the example you shared for yourself at the retreat, but I'm wondering how do you take that same idea and guide people to an experience like that in session with you? Yeah, I call them transformative conversations, you know, because they're really guided by a deeper wisdom than my own intellect, you know, and, and I just show up to sessions and be in the moment with people. And it's not a linear process to awakening, you know, but it's like, it always happens. And it's kind of like pretty much always anyway. And there's no guarantees, but like even today, I, I, I give a, an example of a client that I worked with for a few months today with compulsive eating. And the conversation we had today, and I don't ask about the compulsive eating because that's not the problem. That was like, like for me, it was only ever the solution. I know that that's the solution to a deeper misunderstanding that happens inside for people, you know, and it's quite, for some people, that's quite strange. We're not going to talk about your eating, you know, it's going to, we're not going to talk about your, your gambling or your pornography addiction or whatever it is, you know. It's, well, it's like uh, what you mentioned earlier, like it's just a way to cope and you're really interested in what's, what's at the root of this. Why is this person needing to cope? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly that, you know, so it's like, so along the way, I didn't ask and today was, you know, near the end of the sessions. And I said, how's that? And, and like, she said, oh, it's amazing. I, I don't know what happened, you know, and it's kind of like, and we both laughed about how it came about, you know, it's kind of like that somewhere in the process, she just had found inside of her just the decision to change and it had become simple, whereas she'd been trying to do that for years and not being able to. And that was my experience too, that I could make decisions to change my behavior, but it never lasted because my internal dis-ease was so intense that I always needed the food to cope. Even though it was an unconscious process, I couldn't connect. I'm unhappy with, I need to eat. It just came as an urge. What I've seen with people, the nicer experience they have of being alive, the less they need to medicate themselves, you know? I've never seen anybody wake up one day and go, you know, I'm really happy today. My life feels great. I'm happy for no good reason. I, I think I'll take crack cocaine today. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like nobody does that. You know, right. it's like, I, I know if someone comes to me and says, I'm struggling with food, pornography, sex, money, drugs, alcohol. I know. I, the, my first question is, how's the relationships in your life? Because mm -hmm. it's always that. It's always it's showing always up coping. in that too. Yeah, yeah it's, it's always, always a way to cope. Yeah. I'm still having a hard time picturing this conversation between you and your client. Is it, and maybe it's hard to quantify because I know the whole point of it is an experience, nothing informed by like the prefrontal cortex conversation. But is there any way you can kind of paint the scene a little bit more for us and our listeners? Of is Are you using specific questions to help guide this client into a sense of calmness? Or is it you're just emoting with her what's what's the strategy that you use to help people well for one we're unpicking beliefs you know it's kind of like deconstructing undo, when say, yeah when we're undoing you know i call it undoing rather than doing seeing what's right with you rather than what's wrong with you you know it's like with addiction you know one thing that i help people see is that it's an innocent coping mechanism of the mind body system you know it's kind of like whereas everyone else has pathologized it as a as a problem you know it's kind of like in mind what i'm helping people see is that if we live in a self correcting mind body system you know like you cut your finger it heals itself you break your leg it fixes itself you put food in your mouth digests itself you don't have to do anything it's like so the why would the mind be different why is the standard state of the body health and the standard state of the mind is not you know it's kind of like if you start to think about all these things then think of addiction as like a the steam valve on a pressure cooker you know it's kind of like of course if you make your mind busy with an innocent misunderstanding then if you don't have a steam valve on the pressure cooker it's going to explode so perhaps psychosis or suicide are the next option so it seems like addiction is everything working exactly as it's meant to so I help people see that there's, there's pointing in that way, you know, like helping people see that everything they're doing is an innocent misunderstanding. There's nothing wrong with them and to see what's right and undoing of beliefs. You know, people often hold a lot of beliefs about themselves and often there's a, there's a repressed emotion, you know, it's kind of mm -hmm. like, so we're kind of looking at any experiences where trauma shows up, you know, perhaps there's 
there's not a thought based experience, you know, there's something that just happens, a contraction of the body, you know, in the moment. And it's kind of like really look sometimes with my work, you know, I'm, I'm particularly looking at the somatic experience, you know, what's the body telling us a lot of beliefs are held in the body with people that have had, uh, you know, adverse childhood experiences and traumatic events. So, you know, sometimes it'll be that nonverbal kind of communication with the body, you know, and that could be an inquiry into the body, you know, like looking at a particular experience, somebody would bring something like, I don't know, I met somebody today and then this is the experience I had and I, and I reacted to them, you know, so we yes. kind of re-trigger that event and kind of look at what is the body telling us. Often there's a repressed emotion from childhood or there's a there's an internal belief that got created, you know, a deficiency story. I'm not good enough. I'm never lovable. I'll never make it, you know, something like that that's been created as a response, as a safety response to adverse events in childhood that's then been innocently carried, you know, into adult life and, and as a repressed emotion or just an internal belief that's then that's been embodied and then is responding to the moment, you know, like people are using their food or whatever process they're using to escape from that. Yet, they can't see it even, you know, it's just happening com completely unconsciously. So a lot of it's undoing and deconstructing, you know, undoing beliefs, particularly the beliefs that have been installed by, you know, it, people that they've been to see before and things like that, and helping them see what's right with them, and then processing any repressed or sort of embodied, you know, stuff that's happened from childhood trauma. Not everyone's had a traumatic childhood, but most people, you know, if they, really, they really look at it, they have, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that was helpful. Thank you. I feel like I can picture what you do more now. And it really sounds to me, if I may try and summarize, you can correct me if I'm missing anything, but it really sounds to me like you're using the best of everything you learned, but incorporating it with what was actually helpful for you and actually transformative for you. And it seems like what you just spoke about at least has about three main components. One is the approaching it from a positive model as opposed to a deficient model where you're really helping people have a new perspective of themselves and anchoring in on their strengths and their values as opposed to the quote unquote problem or symptoms as we might say. And then secondly, the deconstructing, which sounds similar to CBT, but I know you're not doing specifically CBT, but really just undoing negative thoughts and undoing negative beliefs and reworking situations and values to be more conducive for them. And then thirdly, you're really giving people a transformative experience, which again, we know is really powerful for change and maintaining change. Like you were speaking about once you had your experience, you didn't really have to do anything, but your eating disorder fell away. Right. And so you're really providing an environment for people to have either a somatic change or an emotional change or just some kind of restorative experience, which is really powerful. Yeah, I haven't finished my book yet, but the way I I put it together in my book is, you know, the first place is I want people to see the not the story, so to see the role of thought in their reality, to see the reality that they've created for themselves, and to see that life is an inside out experience, not an outside in experience. So they start to see the role that they play in their own suffering, in the creation, and the uh, exacerbation that they do. You know, that's, that's how they perpetuate their own symptoms and struggles and beliefs and and stuff like that. Once they've kind of seen that to the point where it's a palpable and noticeable experience, kind of like they start, they're, they're not looking outwardly anymore. They're not coming to me saying, my girlfriend said this and this happened and I didn't get paid and my job hates me. They're not, we're not even having that conversation anymore. We're we call those a uh, crises of the week <laughs> in therapy, yeah, right? They're not, you know, they're not having those anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Very quickly, we're kind of going, you know, this happened and here's what happened to me. Here's how I responded. Here's what happened on my internal experience. So we're straight away introspection, you know, it's like that. Once once there's an awakening of the mind, a realization of beyond the story, it's then kind of looking at the somatic stuff, like you said, you know, and kind of like, and along the way, beliefs will come out and there'll be undoings of different deeper seated beliefs that hadn't been seen in the first part of the process, you know, and somewhere in that people will stop medicating their experience in some way or another, you know, not through effort. You know, not through trying, not through having to or or making it difficult, that it will just make sense to them that they don't need to do that anymore. And I've seen that happen almost every time, you know, and it's like every time I laugh, you know, with joy, you know, it's kind of like to saying, I really didn't know how that was going to come about. You know, I really didn't even think about it. And sometimes when people tell me, I'm kind of like thinking, 
Wow. You know, I, right. But I it's like you equip them happens. with how to yeah. be still and how to process and how to feel again, which is what happened with you and your journey as well. So it makes yeah. sense. It makes perfect sense that you're equipping them with a different way to cope and to process. So they don't need all these other things eventually, which is wonderful. Yeah. And an embodied experience as well. I'd always say is yes. best because like, I, I think like, anyone that's had a traumatic experience is dissociated so much so that they're kind of like I had, you know, I was just completely unaware of the emotional state of the body. And they're like, I used to call myself a walking to-do list. You know, that's kind of what I was. I wasn't connected to my, to my body, you know, and it's like really having that embodied experience of, of being able to feel again, you know, and being connected and it being safe to do so, you know, versus just having a head level seeing of the mind you know absolutely yeah you already had all the knowledge but you needed it to anchor into your experience but you're right it's when when someone has a really traumatic experience or several small ones over the years however it gets there it's the brain doing its job to dissociate from the body but then healing is reconnecting those and calming enough to to connect them so it sounds like that's another way to articulate what you're doing well when's your book going to be done i'm interested in it <laughs> My own experience keeps evolving, you know, my deepest yeah. of truths and stuff. And it's like, I keep end up spending more time going back and looking at changing things, you know, it's kind of like, but I've written most of it. I, I'm, I'm hoping this year it would be released, you know, I explained it to somebody earlier. It's kind of like, at the moment, it's like, a, I don't want to take somebody on a journey, you know, and promise them this beautiful destination and then leave them three quarters of the way and say, here you go. You know, it's kind of like, find the rest of the way yourself. I want to be able to feel complete with it, you know, so. Fair enough. Yeah. I know we could talk about this for hours and hours, but as we're wrapping up, is there anything that you'd want to leave our listeners with who might be struggling with addiction or, you know, maybe they're listening and feeling like this just really resonates with them? Is there any message of hope that you'd want to share? Yeah. I mean, a couple of things. One is the never stop seeking, you know, that there's part of you that really knows, you know, that there's a place of home, that there's, there's respite from this suffering you know and it's never giving up on that and kind of staying with that knowing you know I've, I've been to way too many funerals in my time you know and it always pains me to see that people couldn't find the way out you know and i know that that feels like an option when things are really dark because my life you know suicide was certainly an option for me many times in the in those dark years you know and it's like so never never give up that seeking and you know just just allow life to guide you, you know, it's kind of like, that's what I did, you know, it's kind of like, I was so desperately trying to find help, you know, and it's kind of like when I sort of just noticed that life was kind of guiding me, you know, along the way, it's like people were always trying to help me, but I was so caught up in my own mind that I couldn't really accept help from anyone, you know, it's kind of like, and there'll be people wanting to help anyone who's suffering, you know, there'll be somebody wanting to help and really just allowing whatever help comes your way, you know, just to point you in whatever direction that is that makes sense. And just to know that there's no right way, you know, if somebody's going to guide you, just, just follow that, you know, and it's like, you always end up home, you know, that's kind of, that's my experience of what I've seen, you know, and what's happened in my journey, you know? Mm -hmm. I like that image of home. That was like a central grounding place. And then yeah. whatever happens to you happens, but at least you have home in your mind and your heart. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Where can we learn more about you and your work? The addiction program is called Infinite Recovery Projects in infiniterecoveryproject.com. More conversations, what I call transformative conversations on my podcast, misunderstandings of the mind.com, which is all kind of transformative conversations like this, you know, really looking at our towards our true nature, you know, the spiritual part of us and seeing how, you know, we got a little bit lost in our psychological experience and seeing what's true, you know, like beyond that. Yeah. And you can find me through any of those two places, you know. Okay. Well, we'll keep an eye out for your book sometime in the future. So the Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, this has been such an interesting and thoughtful discussion. And I I feel like you're a really good example of a belief I have that people who suffer can gain so much resilience and so much purpose in the world. And not that it's easy to get there, but I feel like people who suffer have a unique insight and a unique ability to really help other people and get, get a lot out of life instead of just sort of existing without thinking too much about it. 
And I think you're a wonderful example of not giving up and struggling through all of that and and ending up in this wonderful place where you're able to help so many people. And yeah, just appreciate your vulnerability. You know, it probably wasn't easy to talk about all of that, or maybe you're used to it by now, but I appreciate you sharing all of all of your previous experience and how that played into the creation of your your program to help people. Yeah. And if it can just help one person, that's what I always say, you know, I always do this. I always have conversations and stuff if it can just make a difference to one person you know it's like that's that's valuable you know absolutely absolutely well thank you again for making the time i know it's late where you are so i do appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today thank you thank you yeah i also want to thank our listeners for joining jason and i we appreciate you being here with us and as a reminder this show its resources and our other episodes can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash bht So visit triadhq.com slash BHT today and explore our archive. We look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavioral Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community. And if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.